I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dykers, retired, bringing you another true account of the silent service. The USS Pito was the first submarine to be built far inland at Manitowoc, Wisconsin. They launched her sideways, and she sure made a big splash. But that wasn't the last big splash Pito was to make, as the enemy discovered. This is the factual story of her tenth and last war patrol, and of how it changed the whole future life of one of her officers. Our story opens in San Francisco at the Hotel Fairmont. I beg your pardon, Lieutenant. Oh, yes, ma'am. I wonder if you'd mind joining my husband and me for a few minutes. Well, yes, ma'am. I'd be glad to. Honey, I told you, I wasn't afraid to ask the lieutenant over. And I might just as well get to the point right away. My husband just got back from the Lucian Islands. Somewhere along the way, they managed to lose all his luggage. The only uniform he's got is on his back. Well, I have a spare uniform. I'd be glad to lend you, sir. Oh, I know you just can't walk in and buy one off the rack. Not when you're our size. Well, that's mighty kind of you, Lieutenant. Uh, Laboon, sir. Jack Laboon. Uh, my name is Caldwell, and you've already met Mrs. Caldwell. Uh, you have a seat. Well, thank you, sir. Laboon. Laboon, didn't you play football at the Naval Academy? Well, that's right, sir. I'm lacrosse. Uh, what ship are you attached to? The Pito, sir. <laughs> Meet your new CEO. I've just received my orders. I'm the Pito's new skipper. Well, you two get in the conning tower at the same time. Well, I just hope the rest of the crew are midgets. <laughs> <laughs> Early in July 1945, the USS Pito, now a seasoned veteran with nine successful combat patrols behind her, was refitting at Guam. Her next mission was to be a lifeguard patrol, her first. And her skipper, Captain Caldwell, had made a characteristic decision. If Pito was to help flyers, Caldwell figured he ought to know what the job looked like from the other fellow's point of view. So he had taken off from Saipan on a bombing mission over Japan. And believe me, it's a rough deal. There's nothing between you and enemy flight but an aluminum skin that wouldn't stop a BB shot. And crowded? Ugh. You couldn't pay me to go up in one of those crates. I don't mind admitting it. They just plain scare me. Those fly boys sure appreciate our subs on lifeguard duty, Wyatt. They were telling me how many our boots have already saved. Well, just the same. I wish we were going on another combat mission. Well, there isn't enough enemy shipping left to make it worthwhile. For once, we'll be saving men instead of sinking them. Well, if we don't get our refit finished, we'll never make our next patrol. On 14 July, Pito departed from Guam, and seven days later made her first recovery. On 30 July, Pito surfaced at dawn to resume what had now become routine, and somewhat dull and monotonous routine at that. The captain and Lieutenant Frank A. Cook of Rosemont, Pennsylvania, came to the bridge. But shortly after a fighter cover had checked in, normal procedure was sharply interrupted. Radio captain, one check and report a ditch. Time 0745, position 3413 north, 13836 east. Just south of Amayasaki, and right in the middle of a restricted area full of mines. Notify fighter cover. We will proceed to area, but will be unable to enter it. Request El Toro to send jukebox to drop boat to ditched flyer. All ahead flank, right full rudder, cover course 190. Lifeguard.
Lifeguard 9, this is Jukebox 2-2. Do you read me? Over. Jukebox 2-2, this is Lifeguard 9. We read you loud and clear. Over. Lifeguard 9, we dropped a lifeboat to the downed chicken, but it broke in half when it hit. Have notified El Toro, and they're sending Playmate 2-6. Over. Roger, Jukebox. Lifeguard out. the plane all right, but not the guy who's down. Can you make him out? Ah, the water's too rough. That dumb book has got it spotted for him, though. Playmate 2-6, this is Jukebox 2-4. Come to your right a little. He's at about one o'clock on your present course. Over. Jukebox 2-4, this is Playmate 2-6. Relax, son, we got him square on our sides. Jukebox 2-4, this is Playmate 2-6. We got him aboard and all in one piece. Over. Playmate, this is Jukebox. Nice going, fella. Over. Going ain't quite as nice as it looks from where you're sitting, son. Matter of fact, we got us a little problem. We busted a hole in the hull when we landed. We're sinking right now, slow but sure. Gonna take to our raft and hope those lifeguard boys are handy. Hey, lifeguard nine, you all still in the vicinity? Over. My Philadelphia accent, he'd probably take me for a Union spy. Let me two six. This is lifeguard nine. We're standing by about five miles east of you. You're in a minefield and we cannot come any closer. Over. My brother, you sound like home folks. Where are you from? Over. Atlanta, GA. Over. Well, there's gonna be nine of us counting the down chicken and some northerners that sneaked into my crew. We'll be looking for you. Stick around. Over. Head due east. We'll be waiting for you. And good luck. Roger. My feet are getting wet. Better be gone. Out. Lifeguard 9, this is Jukebox 2-4. Over. Go ahead, Jukebox. Over. Both of the boat's outboards have conked out. They can't get either motor started again. They're hoisting their sail. Over. Well, they'll never be able to beat their way out dead into this wind. We'll go in out of them. Out. Thanks, Lifeguard 9. Out. All engines ahead, one-third. Come to course 270. We'll have to take a chance on that minefield. Put two men on the bow, special lookouts. All right, sir. For almost five endless hours, Pito crept slowly through the minefield. Meanwhile, the nine downed chickens, their outboard motors swamped and their sail useless, had taken to the paddles. The best they could do against the violent headwinds was to hold their position, let alone make any progress. At 1700... Formers is made to the bridge. Bring out the bow planes. Rescue party, stand by. Ready with those lines. Stand by forward, Doc. They didn't report any injured, but they may have some. Aye, aye, sir. That's it. Bring a left to zero nine zero. All ahead, one third. No injuries, Captain, but they're pretty well bushed and half frozen. Well, give them a death charge apiece from the medicinal brandy. Yes, sir, that'll fix them. Radio, tell El Toro that we have nine down airmen aboard. Request instruction. Aye, aye, sir. Everything's fine, Captain. No sweat, no strain. Now, the Texas lab requests permission to come to the bridge. He and the others want to thank you, sir. Not now, Jack. 
Tell them once we get out of this minefield, we'll all relax and pat each other on the back. <laughs> but it was well past midnight before anyone aboard Pito had much chance to relax. By then she had successfully made her way out of the minefield and according to the orders she had received, had transferred nine grateful flyers to the USS Gavilan. Message from Admiral Halsey, sir. Well done. My hat's off of the pito. Halsey. Put on a bulletin board, Lawson. That's one for all of us. The next day, the pito was enjoying a ringside seat eight miles offshore for the job the Air Force was doing on Hamamatsu. Roughly in 1552. Plane peeling off. He's hit. Looks as though he's ditching. Right forward, Earth. All ahead, flight. <laughs> Tepito raced towards the down flyer and had him out of the water almost before he got wet. Nice going, Lifeguard 9. It's exactly five minutes since he ditched. Thank you, Roller. You're welcome. A satisfied customer is our best advertisement. I'll Captain, can you come here a moment? It's urgent. My wingman had the ditch close to the beach. Can you go after him? Where's his position? I can show you exactly. Put on the chart, sir. Right about there, he was swimming away from the shore. Within range of those coastal guns. Less than 10 fathoms. Lawson, come to course 285. All ahead, flank. How is it, Doc? He shot through the ankle, sir, but it's nothing I can't take care of. It's way ahead the ditch. 20 millimeter got me. I couldn't keep control. All right, take him below. We'll draw gunfire from those coastal batteries as soon as we get within range. Get it about the main deck. Aye, aye, sir. Exactly on course. About three miles off the beach. I'll keep circling over him until you tell me you've spotted him. Over. Roger and out. It'll be about another five minutes before we are within range. I'm going down below to take a look at that flyer. Take over, Jack. Uh, we're all done, Mr. Sanders, and you'll be running around again in a couple of weeks. Let me give you a shot. It'll put you to sleep till the pain's worn off. No, thanks. I'll wait till they pick up Hugh. I want to make sure they get him. Well, don't worry about that. When our skipper goes after, he gets. Did a great job on me, Doc. Thanks. Yeah, well, I guess I won't get a chance to practice on you, though. Practice? I don't get you. Well, I'm uh, studying for the day when the war is over. Ought to be a doctor? Doctor? No, no, I'm, uh, I'm going in business with my uncle. He's an undertaker. <laughs> I'm glad I can't oblige you. Yeah, <laughs> so am I. Well, how's it going? Feeling fine, Captain. He's doing great, Captain. My name's Corwell. It's E.A. Uh, Sanders, baby. I'm 94 from Lexington. I don't have to tell you I'm glad to see you and your ship. One of your planes just reported to the Lexington that we have you aboard. You think you're going to be able to get Donnelly, sir? Well, he's in pretty shallow water. And right under those coastal guns. If they open up on us, we won't be able to dive. But we'll do our best, Sanders. I don't know how many men you've got on board, Captain. Eight or nine, not counting yourself. Why? I don't have to be very bright to figure out what this means. Deciding to risk this ship, the lives of 89 men just to save one pilot. Thanks. 
Well, I guess it doesn't exactly make sense. But we do it. I gotta get back to the bridge. Try and take it easy. I see him, Captain. Almost dead ahead, about a half mile off the port bow. Fighter, this is Lifeguard 9. We've got it spotted. Over. Good luck, Lifeguard. I'm returning to carry almost out of fuel. You've asked them to send two Hellcats to fly cover for you. I was over at least by a thousand yards. I hope it doesn't do any better. We'll have to put a man overside. Tie a lifeline to him. We'll try to pick this one up on the fly. I can't risk coming to a dead stop and making Tito a sitting target for those guns. I'm going to ask for a volunteer to do the job. Who's the best swimmer on board, Jack? Well, you don't have to ask for a volunteer, Captain. You've got one. All right. Who do you want to hold the line for you? A scooter, the torpedo man. He's strong as a ox. All right. Step on it. Aye, aye, sir. If we're forced to, we'll have to cut the line and leave you both. Good luck, Jack. You take care of the ship, Captain. I'll take care of him. Brangle left two degrees. All ahead, one third. Nobody up here that doesn't have to be. Star Medal was to be awarded to Captain Caldwell and to Lieutenant Laboon, and the Bronze Star Medal to Torpedo and First Class James Skeely for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity. For the next few days, life was comparatively quiet aboard the Pito, if you don't count the enemy plane that dropped the bomb that barely missed, and similar hazards they took in stride. Things were routine until the morning of 15 August, when, with the Pito again on lifeguard duty... Bridgham Radio, we just received word that this morning's strike is canceled. 
Something's cooking. There's a lot of activity on the circuit. Roger, radio. I wonder what's coming off. This is the captain. We have just received official word. The war is over. This is no time for us to get lax. Some enemy planes might not get the word or decide to go out on a kamikaze burst of glory and take us with him. So all normal routine will go unchanged. There will be no splicing of the main brace. But I guess we can at least blow off a little steam. <laughs> Hi, Jack. Peace. Wonderful peace. That sure is a strange feeling. It's, it's going to take some getting used to. Coffee? Uh, no, thanks. I want to talk to you about something. Hi, Ray. What would you say, Captain, if I told you that as soon as we get back home, I'm going to resign from the Navy? You're kidding. No. Why, well, you've got a great future in the service, Jack. With your combat record and your background, why, you're on the way to the top. Well, you know I'm a Catholic, don't you, Captain? Well, there's three things I never ask or care about. A man's politics, his religion, or whether or not he's a reservist or a regular. The thing I want to know is how well he can do his job. Now, what's being a Catholic got to do with this? Well, quite a lot, Captain. You, you see... Saving lives in this patrol has finally made me realize something I've never quite been sure of before. I love the Navy, but I've decided I want to become a priest. Uh, you certain you thought this thing out? It's not a sudden impulse. I know, sir. I, I'm quite certain. It, I've given it a great deal of thought for a long time. Well, if this was for any other profession, I'd say you being a fool. But as it stands, you have nothing but my admiration, although I'm not a Catholic. I'd be proud to approve your request. Well, thank you, sir. I'll be back in a moment with my special guest. And now it gives me great pleasure to present to you the former Lieutenant Laboon of the Pito, now the Reverend Father John Laboon of the Society of Jesus. Admiral, your reenactment of Pito's 10th patrol has brought back a lot of memories. I'm very glad we were able to tell the story, Father Laboon, and I've been curious to know whether you saw Ensa Donnelly again after saving his life under fire. I haven't seen him, but I received a wonderful letter from him. He's Lieutenant Commander Donnelly now, and he wrote me from the Naval Air Station at Corpus Christi, Texas, where he's seen the news of my ordination in the paper. When were you ordained, Father? In 1956, after 10 years of study at Woodstock College. 10 years? Why, that's more than twice as long as the course of the Naval Academy. I don't mind telling you it's more than twice as tough, too. I know you've seen and corresponded with most of your former submarine comrades, Father Laboon. Don't you ever miss the Navy? I can best answer that, Admiral by telling you that I'm now a Lieutenant J.G. in the Naval Chaplain Corps Reserve. So you'll be going to sea again? Well, as you know, sir, I'll have to have been ordained for three years before I'm eligible for sea duty, but I am certainly looking forward to it. When I told your former skipper, Captain Hugh Caldwell, that you were going to be on our show, he wrote me, nothing's changed about Jack Laboon but his uniform. Well, Admiral, at least Hugh Caldwell won't borrow this uniform the way he did my other one the first day I met him. We can be certain of that, and I'm sure that all our viewers join me in extending to you every good wish in your new calling. We've been honored to have you aboard with us on this show. Thank you, Admiral. Please be with us again when we bring you another exciting story of the silent service.